I am delighted to welcome you this morning to stage two at Digit Expo West. Uh, my name is Esther Stringer. I'm Managing Director of Border Crossing UX, and my job is to help you have the best experience you can today. And I've got the easiest job in the world because I have speakers on my stage this morning. So I am super, super excited. Unfortunately, before we get on to our brilliant talks, I have to do a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. We do ask, even though we're using headphones, you turn your phones and your laptops onto silent. Um, there are no fire tests planned today. If a fire alarm goes, it is unfortunately real. Please stand up in an orderly fashion and head to your nearest emergency exit. They are nicely uh, signposted all the way around the hall. There are toilets throughout the building. The toilets just on the side here may look like a cupboard when you walk up to the door. They are not a cupboard, they are a toilet. So do feel free to go and use them. I mean, if you need any assistance throughout the day, there are lots of people in digit t-shirts. Also, I'm wearing a bright pink shirt, so if you see me, feel free to ask me for any help. Do get involved, make the most of your event. There is a wonderful app that you can download and we are using the hashtag Digit Expo West on your social media platform of your choice. I have no wish to preference for you. Uh, the exhibition area is looking great. If you've got a chance, there were some bacon rolls this morning. There will be some great things throughout the day and there are drinks at the very end. But we are here for some awesome, awesome talks. And I am delighted that this morning we are talking about tech for good, something which I am hugely passionate about. And we're kicking off with Biodiversity View, helping nature count with remote sensing. And I am delighted to introduce Lily Bell from Map Impact. And the reason I am delighted, I've just met Lily, but I had a little look into Lily's organization and their vision, why they are founded, is that they believe that nature can be improved in harmony with human activity. That is an inspirational way to start your day. So Lily is an amazing, passionate environmentalist and a technologist. Uh, she specializes in using remote sensing to make some of the planet's biggest environmental challenges measurable. Um, working in both academia and the private sector, she's got a passion in archeology, span and I personally cannot wait to hear what they are doing to help us map biodiversity across the UK and beyond, and how we can use that information to make choices for a better society. So without further ado, please put a nice warm hand round applause for Lily. We're welcome to the stage. Hi, so I'm, can everyone hear me fine, yeah? Thank you. Um, so I'm Lily, I'm the CTO at Map Impact, and um, as was mentioned, our mission as a company is to help nature count. That's kind of our strap line. We see ourselves as an environmental services company rather than a traditional tech company. And as mentioned, we believe in um, essentially improving uh, the harmony between nature and human activity through collaboration and technology. So today, during the presentation, I'm hopefully going to uh, allow you to leave with three new pieces of information because I really believe in the powers of free um, if we can get through them, which is the importance of ecological mapping, um, how we help nature count, and also the lessons learned from the English Local Nature Recovery Strategy Programme, which is essentially a programme which aims to meet the English legislation, well, England and Wales legislation of improving on 30% um, of 30% uh, gain in biodiversity by 2030. But I'm going to start you off with a history lesson. And that's because um, I, as was mentioned, am passionate about archaeology and my other role is um, on as a member of the Scottish Archaeological Finds and Acquisitions panel. Um, with, uh, and essentially for that reason I've got to tell you a little bit about the history of it. So it actually predates what I've included on the map, which is the first um, uh, map uh, of habitats and of uh, nations was Ptolemy's Codex, which is much older. Um, and defined modern geography. He was considered to be one of the first uh, geographers. Um, and then we get to the, we take a large jump to the 1850s in which we get to the invention of the term ecology. And between uh, then and 1926, we also have um, 
the use of habitat mapping to improve on nature for the first time, and in the early 1900s also the use of remote sensing to quantify the impacts of the Great California Earthquake um, using, um, using a hot air balloon and a camera to be able to do so for insurance purposes. And that's part of the history of using mapping for ecological purposes. Um, and to begin us off, I'll start with a definition, which is uh, ecological mapping. So what is a habitat? Um, and a habitat is essentially an environment in which a plant or animal lives, flora or fauna, um, and which connected together make a biosphere or a part of the planet's environment which can support life. And those are just the definitions from the Cambridge Dictionary, um, as you can see. So what is ecological mapping? Well, that answer asks a few more questions. So how do you measure nature? How do you um, draw together the different mapping schemas? Because every organization has their own mapping schemas. Utilities companies have maps um, of what the habitats are, as do um, countries, environmental agencies, and drawing those together um, to be able to inform on what's actually happening on the ground um, is important, as well as um, the technologies in which we use to survey and the level of granularity and accuracy. So there's a trade-off between the, um, I guess, um, the resolution of maps in terms of the habitats that we can show, whether you show streams, which um, can be a number of meters, or whether you um, upscale that to a higher level of granularity based on the type of change that you want to make. Um, and of course, there is measuring change over time, which is one of the challenges of habitat mapping. And one of the reasons why I've been involved in using satellite data for this type of environmental change is that it allows for a more, um, I guess, granular approach from a time perspective. We can update our maps at a faster pace than would be possible using a standard ecological survey that used ecologists in the field across an entire country. Um, and I guess that takes us to the challenge in the UK. So what is the status of UK biodiversity? Well, it's not looking great. It's declined um, by a fifth since 1970, and one in six species are threatened with extinction. And that's the reason why um, in the UK we have priority habitats and priority invertebrates and birds that live in those habitats. And that um, essentially defines the way that um, habitats and flora and fauna interact within uh, within space. Now, you can see that Scotland is um, a little bit higher in terms of our nature intactness, as is Wales, and these are, um, I guess, um, a function of human development um, and urbanisation. And the solution from uh, the uh, UK government's perspective was to set targets, um, and that that would, um, the idea is that that would um, encourage uh, developers to follow those targets and uh, put in public investment that would then drive pi private investment into the same. And so that was the onus behind the 30 by 30 target, the 30% improvement in biodiversity by 2030, and also by um, England's biodiversity net gain legislation, which states that if you're um, in undertaking a development that you must um, show an uplift of at least 10% biodiversity, either within the um, red line border of that or um, purchase biodiversity credits. Um, for off-site purposes if such a gain is not possible. Um, and so one of the challenges of that is that we don't actually know at um, that kind of granularity what the habitats are on a yearly basis and what their condition are, more importantly, and uh, therefore quantifying how you would actually obtain an uplift is a significant challenge. And that's why we developed Biodiversity View at Map Impact, which is a nationwide on-demand reporting tool for terrestrial biodiversity status. So we have an H3 hexagon at 50 meters, which is Uber's uh, geometric uh, scheme for defining space. And so much as we have one all over England that defines what is the habitat within that hexagon, what is the condition and what habitat units and potential for uplift are there within that space. And we use satellite data to do that by combining a selection of terrestrial habitat mapping sources from um, from organizations such as the Ordnance Survey and the Environment Agency. And then we used our approach to measuring condition to work out what the condition of that habitat is on that hexagon basis. So you can see there um, that around the edge of the center of that polygon, there are some very high quality habitats and then in the middle, less so. And the idea is that we supply that data to local authorities to aid in their local nature recovery schemes and also to developers who wish to understand um, what the condition of um, 
of uh, the land that they own is, um, whether it's the land that they've land banked or land that they plan to develop on soon. And the same for large um, infrastructure organizations like solar developers or, um, or wind farms. And the idea is that this is a screening tool not to replace ecologists, but to um, supplement the work that they do because um, the Chartered Institute for Ecological Management reckons that there are not enough ecologists to uh, be able to go out into the field to do this change. And the idea behind what we've done is it's a consistent and objective nationwide understanding of biodiversity where every hexagon is comparable against all the others. And that's what um, essentially allows us to measure that condition is relative to every other hexagon of the same habitat type. Um, and that's quite a, a granular piece because there are many, many types of habitat which may not be that legible there. Um, and how we measure uh, the condition involves um, a ground truthing campaign that we did with ecologists um, in which we um, apply the correct satellite index to measure the relative condition and then compare that hexagon across the entire country. Um, and as I mentioned, ground truthing campaign allowed us to compare our results to the results of a traditional um, a traditional ecological uh, measurement um, in different parcels of land and then um, upscale that to the entire country. Um, and the advantage to our approach is that we have currency of data, so we release a new data set every November um, based on the ground truthing campaign that we do during the summer months, which is the peak phenological cycle for um, plant life um, in the UK in general. Um, and that um, allows us to take the satellite imagery from uh, missions such as the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 and then be able to um, understand the condition and publish that data on an annual basis, which then allows um, evidence of change um, for developers and local authorities over time. And so one question we get asked is, so why the hexagons? And the reason for the hexagons is that they have the greatest connectivity from a geometrical perspective, from a geometry perspective. So they have the greatest number of neighbors compared to say using a, uh, a traditional map grid square, which then allows us to measure the connectiveness and fragmentation of habitats that are larger than a 50 meter hexagon, for example, as many of them are, if we look at Scottish wetlands. And the connectedness of those habitats is itself a key measure of biodiversity because the traversal distance that species are required to do to move between habitats which can support their life uh, is uh, an important measure of how healthy that habitat is and how useful it is for our purpose of helping nature um, and improving on the life of flora and fauna in the UK. So finally, local nature recovery strategies. So as I mentioned, that's a um, piece of legislation that requires the creation of a local map. It also requires um, agreeing on uh, priorities for nature recovery to meet that um, legislation of 30 by 30 and develop specific measurable proposals for the improvement of nature within their patch. There are, 300, uh, there are 326 districts within England and there are 40 responsible bodies that essentially um, take responsibility for larger areas and pull that funding to be able to do that. Um, and with biodiversity view, as you can see there, um, we have the data to be able to inform on um, what the habitats and condition are within that space and therefore meet their legislation, that their legislative requirements um, in a more, uh, I guess, rapid way with the, with because uh, most local authorities have an understanding of the high priority habitats that exist within their patch, but actually the lower value ones less so the types of grassland, for example, but the legislation requires completeness and that's what we give with our um, national approach. Um, I'm going to skip uh, LNRS guidance because this essentially um, defines how an LNRS strategy works, but I'm running out of time. Um, and so uh, there were many lessons learned from uh, the pilot of local nature recovery strategies, um, some of which were to uh, use technology to be able to meet those goals um, in a more, I guess, rapid way because the legislation has been delayed a number of times because of the UK political environment, but also um, the lack of recent data in particular, if you look at the top line challenge there, um, which is something that we um, are aiming to solve with biodiversity view. Um, and so uh, fi finally as well, we also aim to measure change over time. Um, and so that's something that satellite data gives us by um, enabling yearly updates on our data source. So you can see in the next slide with that animation that um, 
what was once uh, grassland there is now urban area, and you can see that based on the surface reflectance from the data, that then uh, says that um, the number of biodiversity units there has actually decreased, and the um, biodiversity for that area has decreased because of urban developments occurred within that um, patch of um, that patch of land. So um, the same there can be shown on that year on year, which is that the um, forestation is actually de increased between those two images, and therefore the condition of that um, deciduous forest habitat has increased. And those are just two small examples uh, at a very local level for where the data that we have can show the evidence that um, nature has improved within um, a given area. Um, I'm now at time. So essentially, um, that's what we do at Map Impact. And if you're interested in contacting us, then we have an info at, but um, I'm also going to be around for the rest of the day. So anybody that wants to have a conversation about helping nature count and all the other things that we do at Map Impact, because this is only one product and I still manage to go over time, then um, please do feel to come over to me. I'm quite distinctive, so you will see me. It's amazing. Thank you very much, Lily. And just to confirm, you were actually just a minute under time, so you were bang on, lovely. There you go. <laughs> Exactly. So we will have some time for Lily for questions after we hear from Sophia. Um, but I would like to introduce to Sophia if you'd like to make your way up. Um, honestly, one of the most impressive CVs that has ever been sent to me is a facilitator. Uh, Dr. Sophia Alessa Bacon is a lecturer in computing science, excuse me, at the University of Glasgow. Um, but she not only has received a PhD from Glasgow, an MSc from the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and a BSc in Mathematics from the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. She is huge in research, and why I'm so excited for her to come today is that Sophia is part of the Computer Science Academy of Africa. And they have, again, an amazing vision. I'm very vision oriented when it comes to organizations to see a world where young Africans in STEM have access to quality computer science education. And I love that, I think that's so important. So I'm very, very excited to hear Sophia talk to us this morning. Um, so if you'd like to give us a nice big round of applause for Sophia, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm not used to being behind the podium, so I'm trying to hide my way. <laughs> Anyway, thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is Sophia, and as I've been introduced, I'm a lecturer in the School of Computing Science at the University of Glasgow. Um, Good trick. All right. So today, I want to talk to you about the transformational impact that Computer Science Academy Africa is having on young Africans. And um, it's impossible to talk about Computer Science Academy Africa without actually first telling you how it all started because it was my own story and my fascinating journey into computing science that led to starting the initiative in the first place. So uh, growing up, I was always good at math and um, problem solving is my pot of soup. You know, I solve math everywhere. And um, when I finished my secondary school, my dad bought me this gigantic desktop computer and that sort of ignited my passion in computing. Uh, but I, I wanted to go study computer science in school because of that, I had so much um, play with the computer. I didn't even know what computer science was at the time. Uh, back in Nigeria, my secondary school, we don't do computer science in school. Uh, we had the computers, don't get me wrong, but we don't have the people who would teach us in a way that would, you know, excite you and get you interested. But when my dad bought me the computer, all I do with it was play solitaire and paint. I'm sure some of you would remember the games. Uh, so that was, that was all I do with it. And then I do a bit of typing and Adobe Photoshop, Corel Draw. So I thought, you know what, I'm amazing. I want to learn computer science in school. Little did I know it had nothing to do with paint and solitaire. Anyway, I tried to get into the university to do computing science. Three times I made an attempt, but where I come from, there are usually too many people than there are spaces in the university. So I could not get into computing science to study the degree, but I ended up in maths as a change of course, not by choice. But when I was offered mathematics, I thought, you know what, I'm amazing at problem solving anyway, let's do this. So I ended up doing mathematics in school, graduated with a first class, and um, throughout my days in school, I wanted to do 
do computing because I was always drawn to it. But there was no mentor, no support. I tried to go to the Department of Computing Science back then at my university. Uh, they learn PHP on paper. They don't code on the computer. We do data structures abstractly. And I thought, this is not my idea of computing science. So I never really got to do computing at all. But the story kind of turned around when I got my master's to go to uh, Ghana in 2014. Um, I went to do my master's at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, Ames, Ghana. You can check it up. Uh, it's this research institute back in Africa. It was started by Professor Neil Turok. He believes the next Einstein would be from Africa. So what he does is he brings in um, academics from outside Africa to train the scientists in Africa with the hope of helping them build self-sustenance and then you know, contributing to, to, the, to the continent via mathematical sciences. So it's fully funded. Uh, we get $100 every month. We get access to laptops, to tutors, to amazing people who teach. So it was during my time at Ames, August 2014, it's not even up to 10 years, around this time 10 years ago, that I got introduced to Python programming for the first time. And that kind of changed everything for me. I sleep in the computer lab just trying to get that code to work. Uh, you know, it was just two weeks because Ames operates in block, but it was not enough to get me grounded in programming language. So I went on Coursera. Everything I knew about computing science was from Coursera. I don't have a background in computing. I took the Python specialization by Chuck Severance from the University of Michigan. Some of you might know that. I took algorithms on graph, algorithms on string. Because of my problem solving passion, combining that with programming, algorithms felt like the perfect point for me to, you know, to do my research. So while I was at Ames, I did a research on machines. I wrote a software for Python. You know, I was able to piece together all of those teeny tiny pieces of chunk of knowledge. And that led me to Glasgow in 2016, which was when I started my PhD. Backstory behind that, lots of rejections, but we won't get into that today. Today is not about me, it's about CSA Africa. So you kind of understand you know, my journey into computing science and how that led me to Glasgow to start my PhD. So without any background in computing, starting a PhD was overwhelming for me, of course, in the beginning. But then around you know, 2017, I've been in the UK for a year, I feel relaxed. And I, I've started to publish papers, and I just started thinking about how, you know, how my journey has led to this point, how two weeks of Python programming can make so much change. And I was thinking of going back home then to visit family, so I thought, why not go back to teach Python programming for two weeks, you know, inspire someone, you could potentially change their life, look how far you've come. And that was what led to Computer Science Academy Africa in 2018. So I went to the School of Computing Science, which was where I was doing my PhD in the university, told the head of school, told him about all the amazing things that we could do with 5,000 pounds. I didn't know it was not going to be enough. I talked to a couple of colleagues in my office. Everyone was excited. So we went to the University of Ibadan in 2018, which was where we ran our first workshop. And um, this was my alma mater. That was where I graduated from. So it was easy to set up the first workshop. And, um, you know, for me, it was all just go back home, teach Python for two weeks, and you never know what could happen to those people. And I didn't know this was going to have like a ripple effect or keep going on and on. So after the 2018 workshop, the team came back. We got lots of good uh, impact from the people we've trained. And um, the school was also very excited about the international outreach opportunity. And they were happy to keep funding CSA every year. So we applied for the Global Challenges Research Funds in 2019, and that enabled us to go to Rwanda. So we invited universities from Africa to apply to host my team, and then we go to run the workshop. So again, just looking at how far the journey was and how much impact we're able to um, acquire within that, you know, within two weeks, uh, that just got me excited and pretty much set the stage for what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. You know, I just want to keep doing this, supporting young Africans, uh, inspiring them and empowering them with that knowledge that will transform their lives beyond what I could even potentially uh, imagine. So in 2020, you know, you all know what happened. It was a pandemic. We could not run a workshop, but I was able to keep the spirit going with an online coding club. And in 2021, again, we did an online workshop. And uh, in 2022, so we were able to run four workshops. Uh, and our last workshop was in 2022. And this was the biggest. We trained about 200 people, 45% women. We had women with kids. We provided childcare support. 
And all of this was, over time, I started to see that we don't have a lot of women participating in our workshop. Why is that? It's not because we don't select them. It's because they don't apply. We don't get a lot of women applying. And I started questioning all of that. So I thought, you know what? We're going to encourage women to apply. We're going to provide feeding. We're going to provide accommodation. And I usually think of all of this before we have the money, OK? I look for trouble, and I'm like, oh my god, we need 100,000 pounds. How are we going to do this? But somehow, the money always comes, you know? Uh, so we provided you know, some support that would enable women to attend the workshop. People came as far away from the northern part, from the southern part of Nigeria. We ran this workshop at the University of Lagos, and that allowed us to scale up the number of people, the number of people we had. And to be able to do all of this, we have had all of these amazing people supporting me, in addition to the School of Computing Science, and uh, a bunch of funders as well, including the University of Glasgow, uh, external organizations like London Stanley, and uh, we've got funding from the Scottish Funding Council under the Global Challenges uh, Research Fund. We've also been featured in the news, you know, the impact of CSA, Whenever I'm in the news, I usually go and hide. I love to do hard work, but I don't like to be in the news, you know. Uh, so a lot of people started messaging me, oh my God, Sophia, I saw you in the metro. I'm like, really? And somebody told me to keep a scrapbook then, but I did not. Now I've been looking for that metro paper. All I have is a photo. But it's nice to be able to show you that, you know, we've, we've been able to feature in the news. I've gone to BBC Scotland to give a talk about some of the impact of CSA Africa and uh, which is why we are here today, to tell you a bit of those impacts of passing on computing skills to uh, people that we've trained. So in retrospect, we've run four workshops, we've um, worked with three host institutions, and over the course of four workshops, we've trained over 500 people uh, from all of these countries. Typically our workshops is face-to-face, -face, and we only aim for the people within country, but in 2021, when we ran online, we were able to reach more people beyond the, the physical uh, countries that we run. So that's why we have that much countries on our list. And um, what I want to highlight is just the achievements we're able to make in 2022, because again, this is one of the things that keeps me going. Uh, like I said, we thought we're able to expand the workshop beyond what we typically used to do. We'll provide support, funding, travel, all of that. So we opened up the application to everybody from everywhere and we received 2,024 applications. That alone, just from 18 African countries, that just lets me know that there's a massive need for what we are doing. And uh, at the end of the day, we're only able to select 200 people from within Nigeria, no one from outside Nigeria, because we did not have the funding to go beyond that. And out of that, 45% of them were women. Oh, you know, what did we do differently? Everywhere on the application, we said women are strongly encouraged to apply. We'll provide childcare support, we'll provide travel support, we'll provide funding. And while reviewing the application, I could see that we had 48% um, applicants who identified as women. So again, it goes a long way to show that a little bit of um, uh, support or contribution to wanting to do something for, for women goes a long way. So we're able to provide daily lunch for all uh, we provided accommodation for 126 participants and travel support for people who came from outside Lagos. And uh, we provided childcare arrangements for women uh, with kids. We had four kids uh, at the workshop uh, with other women who are nursing, but we didn't come with their kids. They left them at home uh, with, their, with their husband. And on to the impact of some of the things we've done. Um, again, these are the stories that keeps us going. Uh, I, I keep in touch with some of these people. Uh, every week I try to call at least one of them just to see where they're at. Also because we are trying to spin CSA out as a charity from the University of Glasgow so that we can get more funding, more um, uh, sustainability, and more um, pretty much standing to do several things that we couldn't do um, being part of the university. So this is Deborah. She was one of our participants in 2018. Uh, she didn't know anything about Python programming before the workshop. And last month, I talked to her. And uh, she's now a mobile engineer at a company in Lagos. Uh, you know, she, she's been able to learn so many other things. What I want you to get is that CSA doesn't teach them everything they need to know about computing, no. 
what we do is pretty much a launch pad. It's like a springboard. You know, you get two weeks of exposure to something you don't know before. And then you get two weeks of exposure to me. I get to give you loads of inspiration and story. And, you know, I pretty much ginger them in a way that they're almost as if there is a fire set under them. And then they go on with that two weeks of knowledge to continue to learn on their own and to do more stuff. Uh, so, again, this is the Walade, one of the people that we trained who also didn't know anything about Python before the workshop, but who went on to uh, do several things and is now a software engineer uh, in Nigeria. Ifyama is um, a data scientist in Nigeria, the same story. Uh, Siman was in our workshop in 2019 in Rwanda. He was able to start a boot camp to train people around him. Um, this lady, Romoke, also didn't know anything about Python. In fact, she said she used to clean at a hotel and somebody bought her a laptop, told her, I think you have an amazing future ahead of you. You are a math student, you should be learning all these things that I see people talking about. And that was how she came about the programming workshop in 2022. She said she almost did not apply because she thought, oh, they're not gonna select me, I didn't know anything. She said she used the application page to do a wallpaper for about a week or two, and that was haunting her. And eventually she applied and she got selected. And she went on after the workshop to get a scholarship, uh, a data camp scholarship. So she's now training to become uh, a data scientist. And she even has enough confidence to teach people around her. So again, these are some of the impact from, from our workshop. Uh, Casey Day was in the 2022 workshop as well. He was part of the Internet of Things track we did. And that has set up you know, a, a maze of uh, thing in his head because he's now, uh, he was able to go on to be a tiny ML engineer uh, at the place we did our workshop. And he's now thinking of starting a startup in AI as well. And again, these are just, you know, I have loads of this. I've just been able to put up some of them on the slide. Uh, the amazing impact of what we've been able to do. Usman is now in India, he's doing a BSc in computing science. Again, transformational impact from the CSA uh, Africa Initiative. So. That's, that's just a bit, a teeny tiny bit of what we've been able to achieve. Uh, and as an ongoing plan, like I said, we are trying to spin out as a charity. We've written a business plan. We've done a market research. We are looking to hire a CEO. If you know anyone who suits the bill, we are not really rich. We're also looking for funding to be able to do more. Uh, any support you can provide would be really uh, amazing. Uh, here are my contact details, and if you scan that QR code, that will take you to this link where you would find all of the social media links uh, for CSA Africa. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Sophia. Would you like to come back and join us? Um, listen, when I... Uh, I've been trying to answer some questions. Um, when I started off, sorry, I'm just going to let Sophia get past. It's a bit tight at the back here. Um, I said this was going to be a great stage, and I think that both Sophia and Lily have lived up to that. Not, we've just heard some amazing talks where people are getting together, enabling, collaborating, and building a better and more equitable future for all through technology. So what an amazing way to start the day. We now have 10 minutes for questions for both Lily and Sophia. Um, if you have a question, if you'd like to put your hands up and we'll get a microphone over to you. Uh, we've got one at the back and then one just down at the front here. I have also got a question, Sophia, thank you. You very much told us how we can collaborate, but Lily, we need to know from you, you said, are you a future collaborator? How can we collaborate with you? Uh, yeah, so um, I guess contact me if you want to. Um, my, my email address is lb at mapimpact.io. I'm obviously, like I said, quite a distinctive person, so you will be able to bump into me later as well. If you're interested in... Um, you know, if you're interested in helping Nature Count in some way, either if you're um, a technologist or if um, you're an organization that has um, nature in your real estate, um, then, uh, you know, we we're, want to help with that. And we are launching our Scotland data set, actually, um, in the next couple of months. So we are looking at expanding up here in terms of um, biodiversity monitoring coverage. Superb, because we have got some exciting rewilding happening in Scotland. So I can ask you. Uh, sorry, but can we get the microphone switched on? Sorry. <laughs> no? Yeah. No, could we use that microphone? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, sir. We will get your question. There we <laughs> so, go. I can yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you, Sophia, for the beautiful presentation. I just walked in at the right time. 
um, and I'm proud to be a Nigerian because you did a good job. And um, I quite appreciate the work you've done. And I will look at looking at, because I think in the same direction too, reason being that one, there was an incident in Nigeria, sorry to take your time. Um, the head of the financial crimes body, he, he, he caught like a 17 year old boy into that is into cyber crimes. Of course, it's, it happens a lot. And what struck him was that the guy was able to hack into his system and he told him he will move everything out of his account under one minute. The guy was scared. And the guy, what the chairman said was that instead of locking this guy up, how can I make him the best cybersecurity guy in the world? So I'm like, in addition to, yes, I've seen you went to um, UI where I was born to and um, Unilag and some other places. There are some that are just school leavers. They are not in the campuses. They don't even have access. How can you bring those guys into the bracket? And trust me, let me shock you. There are some academies, in quotes, that teach them those cyber crimes. They come in bits. So how can you catch them? Because that would even save the world better. Because those guys, trust me, they are smart. I know what I'm talking about. In addition to this, how can we bring those guys into this bracket and make them more productive? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a brilliant question. Yeah. Um, like I said, not everyone gets to go to the university and there are several brilliant people out there. Um, but again, to get started, you know, when you, when you identify a problem, you start from somewhere small and then you slowly expand. Uh, when we started in 2018, we only targeted students within the University of Ibadan. But our 2022 workshop grew beyond that. Uh, our target audience are university graduates, people who at least are able to reason problem solving and um, it's, Tr you, you trust that so anyone with a university degree can cope easily uh, when you are trying to teach them, you know, something that requires our academic thinking. But we don't restrict ourselves to university students particularly. Our application is open to um, people who are, you know, who haven't gotten a university degree, but who are at least done with high school and um, professionals as well who have left the university uh, who probably want to upskill. So our workshops are not restricted to to university um, students per se. And I guess just following up on what you're saying is beyond um, trying to target a university student, when CSA has that stronghold, you know, when we're able to train enough people within our target audience, then we can begin to reach out to the community, use those people to grow other population that we are unable to reach. And that's part of our goal as well. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, Hi, I have a question for Lily. My name is Joanna McKenzie. I'm a data scientist. I'm kind of interested in what you might call the root to value from the, all the measurements that you're making. I know how wonderful it is to measure the biodiversity that you're talking about, but how does that then translate into action? Who are the stakeholders you're trying to reach and what sort of changes would you like them to be making based on what me you're measuring in there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That is a great question. Um, and so, one of, one of the things that's um, an advantage on biodiversity in England and Wales is that it is um, a financial instrument in so much as um, you can purchase biodiversity credits that have a financial value to them. Um, the um, stakeholders that we look to engage with are developers, utilities, um, utilities companies and local authorities. And what we're looking for them to do with our data is to either improve on the quality um, of um, a patch of land which we can then measure in future years and allowing them to meet their legislative requirement to do so for 30 years um, and also to change habitats as well so for example to change uh, cropland to a lowland meadow for example which has a higher biodiversity value for that area and encourages um, the growth and movement of um, more diverse types of flora and fauna than say agricultural working land might um, and so those are the changes that we, we want organizations to do. And because we are um, in it for the long term in terms of um, the monitoring requirement with the legislation, um, we are then able to actually see that they are making those changes. So we know that a habitat is moving from croplands to meadow, or we know that um, the overall condition of um, wetlands is increasing, for example, in a quantifiable manner um, that would then uh, generate more biodiversity credits or, um, or um, what are called habitat units in England and Wales. And we're expecting the same type of legislation um, which uh, essentially drives what it is that we do in Scotland, but also 
um, looking likely in Australia and in the United States. Um, but the biggest challenge to that is, um, you know, a nationally exhausti exhaustive habitat mapping, which is essentially the exercise that um, Scotland has now undertaken and which, um, and which Australia and um, the US are currently in, the, um, in progress in terms of undertaking. As a, someone who has a cousin who lives in Orkney and is getting rid of the stoats, fully yeah. understand that issue. Listen, we've run out of time here on stage two for the Tech for Good session. Please give Lily and Sophia a massive round of applause.